If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Sometimes when there's technical difficulties, you might be tempted to think it's the guy upstairs' fault. Sometimes that might be the case. Most of the time, however, it is the guy who set up the things upstairs. So you could say that I inadvertently set up Chet to fail today. Um, that was not my intention. I, I, I feel bad about that. Uh, <clears throat> it, worked when I, it worked when I tested it. Um, and then it dawned on me as I was sitting here that I went and saved it a different way. And so, yeah, it, it, it is my fault. Um, we'll, get that, we'll get that working later. But let me just tell you something, and, and this is a testimony to the providence of God. And if I keep talking here, it's not going to matter. But uh, <laughs> in, my, in my notes today, I, I wrote and I, and I put a line in there and I said, stop here unless time allows. And then I, and then I wrote more. So one could say I was prepared um, without even thinking that that might be an option. Um, Romans chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4 today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read, um, I'm going to start in verse 1. So if you would stand with me as we honor the reading of Scripture together. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're again coming to this, this, this subject of taking advantage of grace, sinning so that grace might increase. Lord, and, and we know that, that our sin doesn't make you look good. Lord, we, we've died to sin. Lord, and as, and as we approach that, that unity that we have with you in death, Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear. I pray that our hearts would be open and receptive that our eyes might see the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would work great things in our lives today through the proclamation of your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As I'm standing here thinking, I'm thinking that, that I did put a couple things in here because I... I assumed that we were going to watch that video, but I'll just have to explain that when we get there. Um, I would guess that, that as you got here this morning, and as you took your, your bulletin, and as you looked at the front cover, and you saw baptism, you were a little bit, of, little bit confused. Because... You might have asked, are we doing baptism today? Is it, what, what's, what's the deal? And then you looked in the, in the text and, and you said, well, we haven't left Romans yet. And, and then you looked and then you heard the, the text being read. and you, oh, I, Baptism, I, I see that. But then again, there's still confusion. Maybe even more confusion. 
Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? What does that mean? I think some of the confusion comes here from the fact that when we think baptism, we automatically think the sacrament or ordinance of water baptism. Perhaps the image on the front of the bulletin didn't help there. <laughs> there's, there's water there. But hopefully as, as we visit about this for the next few minutes, the image will be made a little more clear. It'll make sense. It was not meant to bring confusion but clarity. And I think at the end of this it will. Let me just suggest here that Paul isn't speaking of water baptism. He isn't speaking of the ordinance that one does after they become a Christian and they, they make that profession of faith. The fact is, in the context, it really wouldn't make much sense. We know that, that Paul has been speaking about our union with Christ that's, that's the context here, going back to, to chapter 5. No longer is the Christian united with Adam in death, but now the, the believer, he, she, is now united with Christ in life. And then we get to chapter 6. And this is where chapter 5 and chapter 6 are connected. That's made clear in Paul's first question. What shall we say then? What shall we say to What? What he just said, specifically speaking about his comments in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 5, that grace is destined to reign. That where sin increases, grace increases all the more. Right? Where sin grows in number and multiplies in number, grace overflows. That's the picture. And in chapter 6, Paul is dealing with the anticipated question that comes up. If grace is destined to, to reign and triumph, then why can't we go on sinning so that grace will increase? Wouldn't my sinning or my continuing in sin actually highlight the grace of God. Because the more I sin, the more God's grace covers it up. I started looking at that last time, and you can always go back and check that out. But let me just read those verses again. Kind of start seeing the context here in this text. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? By no means. Certainly not. God forbid it. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into his death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The key there is in verse 2. The statement there is, is what Paul is unpacking. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It doesn't make any sense. Right? That's his, that, that's his point. You say that we can continue to sin, that grace might increase, but for the Christian, that doesn't even make sense. That doesn't compute on a number of levels. Last week, we looked at three of those. We looked at why God saves us, God's purpose in saving us. We looked at how He saved us. And then we looked at the definition of grace briefly. Now, it's important to understand that in these verses, Paul is going back to the past. Notice that he says to believers that they have died to sin. Not that they are dying, but they have died to sin. And the question is, is when did that happen? We said that it happened at the moment they placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and were justified by God. And at that moment, there was this union that happened with Christ. He died for our sin, and we died in him to sin. Now Paul is continuing explaining that. 
and uses the word baptism here. But notice he isn't using water baptism as an illustration of what happens to us at the moment of regeneration. I think that some, of, some would like to see this as just an illustration of what he's been talking about, but that isn't what he's doing. Just look at Paul's choice of words here. In verse 3, he speaks of being baptized with Christ as a past event. You were baptized with him. And it's clear that he's speaking about believers here, not just water-baptized believers. Because he says that those who are baptized into Christ were, past, were baptized into his death. So, so one can tell from the context that Paul is speaking of this, this union with Christ that he's, been hap- that he's been talking about before. It all goes back to chapter 5. He's just using a, a different word to bring it home here. And this union that he's talking about happens at the moment of conversion. The moment that one is justified in Christ by faith alone. Which would have been the video we watched. So, if Paul is not speaking of of water baptism here, the question then is, is begged, why does he speak of baptism at all? Certainly our minds... When we hear the word baptism, brings to mind water baptism in profession of faith. Let me see if I can illustrate what is at stake here. And then I'll move forward and ask the question, answer that question, and, and look at the word baptism and how it's used here. I would suggest that when the people that Paul was writing to heard the word Baptism, they didn't necessarily associate it with the ordinance like we do. I'll get to that in a minute, but that's, that's kind of the, the point. Is We need to put ourselves in the position of, of the reader. And, and they didn't understand it that way, and, I'll, and we'll get to that. But first of all, I, I just want you to see what is at stake here. I mean, is this a, a meaningless point to draw, or is there something that's really at stake? Would it really matter if Paul was speaking of water baptism here? Right? The phrase that Paul uses here, baptized into Christ, or baptized into his death, in order, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Look at those, those words. Do you see what's at stake? Because water baptism then would be equal with justification or union with Christ in his death. If, if one gains that at, at water baptism, then it's the water baptism that, that unites you with Christ. It would be water baptism is the trigger that allows you to live this new life that he talks about at the end of verse 4. So if you're, if you're not really baptized, you're not in Christ and united with him in his death. You see that? It works both ways. The baptism that Paul is talking about here that happens at the moment of conversion unites you with Christ. If he's speaking of water baptism here, then that union with Christ must take place at that time. See what I mean? This text cannot mean that. If this text meant that, it would undo everything that Paul has said in the last five chapters of Romans. It would mean that justification does not come by faith alone, but it comes by faith plus baptism. And we know that that is not what Paul's teaching. Because Paul has already dealt with this in the, in the area of circumcision. There was people, they were, they were teaching faith alone, faith plus circumcision. He said, that's not the case. It's faith alone that saves, not faith plus something else. He's dealt with this. Now, you might be saying, well, does anyone really believe that? That the, the sacrament of, of believers 
baptism, not, not infants. I'm not talking about Catholics. Does, does anyone really believe that, that believers' baptism really joins us to Christ and therefore is necessary for salvation? And the answer is yes. I, I know of, of places, um, and, and I'm not going to highlight local things. I'll just go, I did a Google search on the internet in about three or four minutes. I found a small church in Sandpoint, Idaho, Sandpoint Church of Christ. You can find it on uh, the internet. You can read this to make sure that I'm right. They have a, a frequently asked question section on their, on their website. And one of the, the frequently asked questions is this. Do I have to be baptized to be saved? That's kind of the question we're looking at, right? Now, the answer to that question is pretty long. I printed it out. It was five pages, but the font was pretty long. And the answer starts this way. The following outline below will answer that question. And that's the, the five pages. So what, what follows then is, is this statement entitled, Baptism, the Reception of God's Grace. Underneath this, there are several points with a lot of verses under each, and I'm not going to take time and try to explain how they support each of these statements. Um, but let me just give you the, the basic outline. The, the question, what is baptism for? One, Baptism saves you. That's pretty clear. Two, baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Three, baptism puts one into the body of Christ. Four, baptism unites us with Christ. There you can probably guess what text is cited. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. You guessed and as we pointed out, that only makes sense if you haven't read the first five chapters of Romans. But that's what they say. And then five, baptism is how we call in the name of the Lord. So in closing, this statement, I'll just quote from the end of it. And it says this, Friend, have you been truly saved? Good question, right? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you repented of your sinful lifestyle, confessed Jesus as your Lord, and been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? In other words, the question, have you been truly saved, is a question relating to baptism. If you haven't been baptized, you may not have been truly saved. And he says this, if you believe in Jesus and are ready to repent, then why wait? Your eternal salvation is at stake. In baptism. Your eternal salvation is at stake if you haven't been baptized. This doesn't seem to be and isn't what Paul is teaching. And it isn't what he's teaching now here. So the first thing that we need to do is recognize that in the Greek here, there, there are two closely related words for baptism that don't necessarily have the same meaning. One is used in Scripture, the other is not. It's used in, in other uh, writings, Greek writings about the same time. Uh, one word is, is a short word, it's the word bapto, B-A-P-T-O. It, it just means uh, to dip or to immerse. You can see where we get our word baptism from it. The other word is, is baptizo. That's the word that's used in Scripture. It's, it's longer. And it, and it may mean to immerse, to dip, but it also has other meanings as well. And, and now this isn't unusual in Greek. In Greek, there are usually multiple words. The simpler word conveys meaning that is more straightforward than the longer word. The longer word could have more specialized meanings. It sometimes was even used metaphorically. Now, in the New Testament, we see this longer word, baptizo, used for baptism. 
So when we see that word, we recognize that it can simply mean to immerse, or it can have more of a specialized meaning. Now, according, now, this is how I understand it. About 400 years before Jesus, this longer word started to be used. And at that time, it was used, and, and it was emphasizing the change that takes place by immersion. Okay? The change that takes place. For instance, Josephus, the, the, the historian, he used it to describe how crowds flooded in to the city of Jerusalem and wrecked the city. You see, the crowds came in like a wave and baptized the city. They immersed the city with people. And in that immersion, they wrecked the city. There was a change that took place by that. There are other examples of how the word was used. Dyeing a cloth, for instance. You, you immerse the cloth in a dye a change takes place, right? The white cloth becomes blue or, or whatever. Uh, drinking too much would have been an, another way in which the word was, was used. You, you immersed yourself in alcohol, and, and because of that, there was this, this change in, in personality and, and speech and all of that that, that occurred. There was a, a Greek poet about 200 years before Jesus, and he wrote a recipe for making pickles. And... Uh, he says in this recipe that the, the vegetable should, should first be baptized, and, and he uses the short word, bapto, should be baptized in, in boiling water. So you, you dip it, you immerse it in boiling water. That was the idea. And then he said after that, it should be baptized, and now he's using the different word, baptizo, into a vinegar solution. Both words mean to immerse. The first one was a temporary, a preparation step for the other dipping, the other immersion. And the dipping in the vinegar solution was the one that produced the change. The cucumber becomes a pickle, right? So, the first one is temporary. The second one produced the change. Now, I hope we're starting to see that the way Paul is, is using this word here. It's, it's not necessarily speaking of, of water baptism in the way that we typically understand the word baptism when we hear it. For example, Galatians 3.27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now, think about that statement for a minute. Clearly, he isn't speaking of water baptism there. Because if he were, then to clothe yourself with Christ wouldn't make sense, and it would be inappropriate. The, the idea is more like how a child identifies with a father by putting on his shoes and his hat. Or a soldier identifies with his country by wearing a uniform. So now the question is, is how, how should we understand this text? Well, the idea is that when we're baptized into Christ... This is our being united with him by the Spirit of God. This is rebirth. The, the old has passed away. All has become new. And now we identify with, with Christ in, in life, in resurrection, and not Adam in sin and death. We identify with Christ now in every respect. In his death, his burial, and resurrection. But notice what Paul emphasizes here. He emphasizes burial. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. And what Paul is, is saying here is that to go back to a life of sin, once you have been joined with Christ, and this change by the, the Spirit of God has been produced in your life, you're no longer dead, you're alive. To go back to that sin would be akin to digging up a dead body. That, that's his point. That's why he's taking. You have been buried. It's not just that you, not just that you identify with him in death, but you've actually been, been buried. And to go back to that makes about as much sense as digging up a, a dead body and trying to, to live through that. Now, we said that this text wasn't about water baptism. It isn't the water that unites us to Christ and produces this change in us. 
It is the Spirit of God that does that, whereby we go from death to life. Now let me just interject here. This baptism in the Spirit that Paul is talking about takes place at the moment one places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It doesn't take place some other time in the Christian walk. It's not a, it's not a second blessing. Being baptized into Christ is being united with Christ. And having said that, we need to take just a moment and speak of the significance of water baptism. We don't want to downplay water baptism because water baptism points to the change that we've been talking about. That's, that's the point. One really needs to understand the things that we've been talking about or you can't understand water baptism. When we were baptized by the Spirit at the moment of conversion, it accomplishes something. Water baptism in itself doesn't accomplish, accomplish that. But it publicly professes that that change has taken place. It publicly professes that that, that, that person has gone from death to life. And to go on living any other way is like digging up the dead. I think that whenever somebody is thinking about being baptized and taking that step of obedience and publicly declaring that, that Jesus is the Lord of my life, I think we need to realize that, that for most people in, in Christian history and people in the world today, that baptism is seen as a, a bold and risky endeavor. Often the, the believer's life is even in, in jeopardy. I mean, even from within the Christian ranks, like some of our ancestors, but, but often from without. For many living, there was nothing wrong with listening to Christian preaching, talking about what it means to be a Christian, talking with other Christians. But when a person was baptized, this was different. He or she was saying to the, to the people all around them, to the world, to fellow believers, even to the state, that he or she was a follower of Jesus above all else. They were now loyal to him, first of all, no matter the cost. Baptism said, Christ before Caesar. Let me just quote James Boyce here. He says, The baptism Paul is talking about is something that has been done to us. The sacrament of baptism is nevertheless a fit public testimony to what baptism into Christ by the Holy Spirit means. That we have been united to Christ and that the old life is done for us forever. End quote. That's what baptism says. I've put my faith and trust in Christ Jesus. I am united with him. It doesn't make sense anymore for me to go back to the old lifestyle. I'm done with that forever. Like when we take and, and bury somebody who has passed away. They're done. You don't go dig them up. You want to know what they look like? You want to go back to that, that sinfulness? You want to enjoy that once again? That's like trying to dig up your mom who's been dead for 20 years and trying to enjoy her presence again. Doesn't make sense. Baptism is telling the world that you are not going back. That... You're going to progress forward with Jesus. Water baptism is display of the baptism that Paul is talking about here. This is why we baptize believers by immersion. This is why we don't sprinkle them. It's why we don't pour on them. 
Because even in that, you see the death, burial, and resurrection being portrayed. You see that union. You picture it. You can't miss it. It's, it's the symbolism of what Christ has done to them. The moment they placed their faith in Jesus Christ, the moment they died to sin and were united with Jesus Christ, is made clear. And they're raised to the newness of life. I'm progressing forward with Him. So even the dipping or the immersion is a public profession of that. What a beautiful picture. Now let me ask you another question here. Changing gears a little bit, what if, what if the, the believer does fall into sin? Because it almost sounds like here that any time any believer sins, it's putting their eternal security in, in jeopardy. Christians don't sin. But practically, we know that we do. So being baptized with Christ produces real change. We die to sin. But we still sin. Right? On this side of eternity, we're still going to do it. In fact... Many times we fall into sin before we even realize that we have fallen into sin. So perhaps we're to wonder, what if we do go back and start living that same way again? What, what if we go back to, to start a life of sin again? Let me just give you a few things to think about here. First of all, if you're a believer, it just doesn't work that way. If you're a believer, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, you, you fall into to, to sin temporarily, but that doesn't become your life. It just doesn't make sense. It's like an adult who desires to become a child again. Right? Now, it can't happen. <coughs> An adult can be childlike for a time. They can have moments or times when they are foolish and immature. They can do things that are quite childlike, but they cannot become a child again. You see, those that are Christ and those that are His, it's, it's obvious. It's obvious like Peter, who's spending time with Jesus changed him. He could not convince people that he was not Christ's disciple. He could curse and wail and say, I do not know him. And people didn't believe it. People know that you're Christ, even though they're moments of childlikeness. Second, thing that we need to keep in mind is that God does not put up with those who go back. You see, God will stop us from continuing in it. This is a hard truth. And I believe it's true. That God will either make our lives so miserable because of our sin that we will abandon our sin and turn back to God... You see, God doesn't stop us from sinning. But He doesn't let us continue in it. He makes us miserable. And in our misery, we turn back to Him. And either God will do that or He'll put an end to our life. I'm getting that from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30 where Paul says that some of the Corinthians have dishonored the Lord's Supper and that God even took some of them because of that. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some of you have even died, he says. The next thing 
if we're truly His and, and we turn from Christ to our sin and we start to pursue that and God lets us continue in it, we're not miserable. We love our sin. We choose that over Christ. Then we're not saved. This is why the author of Hebrews says that it's that it was impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. It's impossible. The author of Hebrews isn't speaking of a, a genuine believer having tasted this. That doesn't make sense in, in light of what we studied in Romans. What the author of Hebrews is speaking of is one who has been exposed to all of this. They've been exposed to all of this. They, they know this stuff. They've been exposed to the Word of God. They've been seeing God do a, amazing things in the lives of the people around them. They've seen radical change in, in people. They've seen the Spirit of God work in marvelous ways, yet they continue to sin. They fail to embrace Jesus Christ as the Lord and the ruler of their life. It says here that what has happened is that they were actually inoculated against Christianity. They were exposed to enough of it that they don't even think about it anymore. They don't think about it being a serious thing. They just pass it off. Just think of the diseases that we're inoculated against. We don't give them much thought, do we? Not like they used to before a vaccine. And it's the same here for these. So we come to a, the question here at the end. Have you been baptized into Christ Jesus? Not water baptism. I'm speaking of union. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Turn from your sin to Him, allowing the Spirit of God to come in your life and produce change in you from the inside out. If you have sat here today and realized that you need that, you need Jesus, I would love to talk with you after the service. Perhaps you realize that, that in all of this discussion, that you need to be baptized with water. That you need to make that public profession of faith. That you need to tell the world, I am not going back. Maybe you've never made that profession of faith. You want the world to know, Christ is my ruler no matter what. I will not go back. I would love talking to you about that as well. At this point, we're just going to we're just going to say a prayer. We're going to end the service. Um, I would ask um, that you stand with me as we pray together. Uh, would you do that? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for, for each and every person that is here today. And we pray that as we contemplate what it means to place our faith in Jesus, as we think about death to sin and, and being united with Christ, Lord, I pray that we would associate it with the term baptism. I pray that we would see this, this immersion as producing this change in us. A, a change in which we can testify to. Which we profess in water baptism. In the way that we live our life. Lord, I pray that we would leave here today and that we would cling to you. That we would show by the way in which we live that you are our master, you are our ruler. I pray that your spirit would continue to produce change in us, allowing us to live a life that is new, a life that is holy. Lord, and I pray that you would continue to grow us.
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.